very warm welcome to everyone, uh, both here in the room, the hundreds here in the room, the hundreds at different other universities and many more online. Uh, this event is organized by the Ukraine Society of Our Student Union in partnership with their counterparts at other universities. And I pretty want to mention them just to show how many of them are here. University of Birmingham, University of Cambridge, City University here in London, Coventry University, University of Glasgow, University of Manchester, University of Oxford, and University College London, together with us, of course, here at the London School of Economics and Political Science. My name is Eric Neumeyer, and I'm one of the school's co-directors. We want to leave maximum time to spend with our main speaker, His Excellency Ukrainian President Zelensky. Welcome, very strong welcome, whom we are very honored to host via video link. And so I will hand over straight to my colleague, Chaloka Bejani from the LSE Law School, who will chair the event and moderate the discussion. Chaloka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for your kind words of welcome and introduction. It is now my singular honor to be able to invite His Excellency President Volodymyr Zelensky to give his address. Mr. President, please. Thank you very much. Esteemed ladies and gentlemen, esteemed uh, students, faculty, professors, academics, scientists, um, um, we uh, have uh, the record um, of the boat race um, in, uh, on, tem on Thames between uh, Cambridge and uh, um, Oxford. The first uh, regatta took place on this very day on the 10th of June, almost 200 years ago. Yes, uh, this is just a symbolic uh, fact, uh, and uh, I'll be frank with you, it doesn't change much for my address. Uh, I can compare this uh, with Ukraine, with uh, us uh, uh, swimming against the current, and our uh, country is trying to fight uh, the Russian warships uh, still afloat, um, and we would like to feel like we're not alone, that all the countries of the free world are in the same boat. And Ukraine does not have to, <clears throat> on the 107th day of war, uh, to issue SOS uh, signals for everyone. I can tell you more, but I do not want this address to last for 16 uh, minutes, 19 seconds, like the old record 200 years, years ago. In preparation for this uh, meeting, I read about uh, history and traditions of your respective educational institutions for us to speak the same language, for us to discuss present day of Ukraine clearly and uh, well for everyone. For 107 days, we were have been fighting the aggression of the Russian Federation. Our um, ability to hold the line comes as a wonder, as Oxford electric bell. Nobody still can tell exactly how it works and how it is designed. The same with Ukraine. For 107 days in a row, uh, we uh, have generating this energy uh, to oppose the second army in the world, protecting ourselves, defending Europe, and if Ukraine has flat batteries, that will be a real energy crisis for the planet. Uh, 107 days we have been uh, tested for survival and resilience. Every day we pass uh, the um, uh, Cambridge uh, test and uh, the tripods, uh, but we have to listen to wailing of sirens uh, for 107 days. We have been opposing the barbarians. Uh, people who are not inhuman. The army of um, the person who should not be mentioned uh, according to some positions. And of course, um, uh, the same goes for his gas and oil. For 107 days, we uh, have um, opposed uh, the um, enemy who did never read Bernard Shaw, one of the founders of London School of Economics. Uh, we can uh, fly like birds, uh, swim like fish, but we, the only thing missing is to learn to 
live on this planet as humans. And the enemy who wouldn't recognize the truth at um, Birmingham uh, uh, University Rector fought for uh, Robert Cecil, the Nobel Prize winner on the um, necessity uh, for humanity to solve the problems, not in the trenches, but at the tables with arguments, not missiles and rockets. 107 days, we have opposed the state which uh, has a new form of, uh, of uh, color blindness. The whole black, white, and white black. They talk about peaceful goals, but their goals are peaceful cities and villages. They're killing children and women, calling that uh, self-defense. 80 years ago, Manchester survived uh, the uh, Christmas booming. And uh, this year, all Ukraine had Easter booming. And 80 years ago, Nazi invaders would uh, ruin Coventry. This year, the Russians uh, created in the territory of Ukraine tens of Coventries, uh, Bucharpin, Borodyanka, Kharkiv, Mariupol. 107 days we have been fighting a nuclear state. Uh, that uh, uh, can be called, um, can be given a, a Darwin's Prize for not knowing the international law and uh, um, violent in it. I've um, got ready for this conversation. You can see that. Can we be humorous? Uh, can we be ironic? Of course we can. There's no other way. Other way. I can give you more analogies called hundreds of uh, alumni of your um, respective universities, but let me be frank. Um, what do you know about Ukraine? Uh, recently, students of Edinburgh University um, um, absolutely uh, exposed their professor. He was uh, um, um, repeating the Russian narratives, uh, lecturing students. And uh, this news, like hundreds of other signals issued by you, testified to at least three things. The war in Ukraine uh, is not something you do not care about. This war is visible and um, monstrous. The truth is known, it's important. And you know the truth about Ukraine and its war. You know about Ukraine because of the war. You are um, reading about bombardments of Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Odessa, but do you know that those cities have uh, sister cities, Leeds, Birmingham, Liverpool, have you heard about uh, the uh, Kiev letter? This is a document, uh, um, and this is, uh, which is 1,000 uh, years ago, and uh, it's in Cambridge Library right now, about uh, Queen Margaret, the first uh, saint of uh, Scotland, uh, granddaughter of Yaroslav the Wise, uh, the Prince of Kiev. Have you heard about uh, John Hughes, who founded Donetsk, or founder? Uh, Luhansk, uh, um, the Scotchman uh, who um, built the first um, coal mine in Ukraine. We have uh, lots of joint, uh, joint histories. I'm not trying to expose anybody's lack of knowledge, but this describes the essence of war that is fought by Russia against us. The mission is uh, to delete our history, our state, our identity, and to deny our existence and as such, and to tell the world that we never existed, that we are an artificially created people, like a variety of some kind of plants or animals, and that uh, um, downgrades our culture, our language, and that denies our arts, our philosophers, our academics, our scientists, our designers, our inventors, our writers, our great rulers, and great warriors of uh, Kievan Rus, of, uh, of the Cossack state of uh, Zaporizhia, uh, and uh, the new generations still to come to delete all um, memories of Ukraine uh, as a country without any past, any present, and hence no right to the future. 
why uh, would they do that? Well, because uh, they have uh, this uh, vision, this phobia of uh, freedom at the state level. And they do not know what freedom is. That's why they are scared and apprehensive. If uh, freedom and some neighboring country uh, next to them, this is dangerous for Russia. Uh, this is too close and they want to destroy it, but they will um, lose. We are fighting for our future. They are fighting for somebody else's past. But the time for such countries and such rulers uh, is gone. Our time it belongs to us and our future belongs to us. And this is our active voice, a, a, a real voice. Uh, and uh, let's speak with that voice today. And uh, I do not want my speech to last for 16 minutes, 19 seconds. So let us uh, start an exchange. And uh, I will uh, promise to be very open. Glory be to Ukraine. Thank you very much. The applause speaks for itself. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your captivating and sobering address. Students in each one of the participating universities will now have an opportunity to ask the president strictly one question. We'll start with a question from the Ukraine Society of the LSC Students' Union, Danilo Nikforov. Danilo? Thank you, Chaloka. Uh, thank you very much for finding time to address uh, us. Uh, uh, and let me continue my to be a reliable ally for uh, Ukraine in uh, countering Russian aggression. Beyond memorandums of cooperation, how exactly will they envision trilateral security pact between Kyiv, London, and Warsaw uh, contribute to European security? Thank you. Mr. President, please. Thank you very much for this question. I heard some part of it, but I uh, heard the key thing, the triangle. Uh, Kiev, London, and Warsaw, and what kind of uh, security, uh, international security, uh, can it provide uh, for the future of our region? And uh, before I discuss the future, uh, let's just look, have a look at uh, the, our present day with a full-scale war situation, some alliances, some security dialogues and actions are um, spontaneous. They depend on the society and the leaders of the societies in specific countries. And this triangle is also uh, self-propelled, self-induced. And uh, in addition to history, we have uh, uh, that uh, present situation from the very first day of the war, we had uh, chemistry among the leaders of the three countries you mentioned. Uh, from the very first day, we arranged our relations based on support, uh, powerful support from uh, Prime Minister Johnson and people who were demonstrated in the central streets of London. And uh, President Andrzej Duda and people uh, in the capital, Warsaw, um, Botslov, and other cities and towns. Uh, those people supported us and leaders of those states. From the very first day, we maintained uh, our uh, communication every day, discussing support of Ukraine. Not with words, but with deeds. Uh, military equipment, uh, uh, the weapons, and the Poland uh, provided. Uh, that and the principal promoter in addition to the yes uh, was official London. This is true. And uh, the United Kingdom wasn't the engine, the driver of that process. And we uh, created uh, that trust. Um, our armed forces have trust in uh, the British forces. Our 
uh, leaders, our warlords talk to each other. We help each other. And presently, um, every day actually, I have some kind of communication this, uh, with different uh, important leaders of the United Kingdom. Um, ben Wallace today, a couple of days ago, I talked to Prime Minister Johnson. And today, uh, here we have uh, a Minister of Defense uh, of the UK. And there are many meetings at the ministerial level and the assistance is coming, in, it's coming indeed. And today we have this platform for relations. This speaks uh, for not just uh, uh, some F foreign efforts. So they are helping us. Uh, and uh, uh, when we win and we shall win, we'll share this victory uh, with um, our friends who supported us all the way, um, uh, building up uh, the future security of the world. And that triangle, we're discussing the um, detail of the future security safeguards for Ukraine and for the region by the same token. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your eloquent answer. May I now invite in alphabetical order questions from universities that are participating uh, in this event. Uh, first of all, University of Birmingham, moderator, Professor Alexandra Kaboski, Director of Global Engagement. Professor Kaboski, please. Good afternoon from University of Birmingham. I hope that you can hear me. Um, and if I can uh, just uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and if, uh, Mr. President, I can thank you for taking time to talk to us uh, to our students and staff. As you can see, there's a lot of us here. Um, and also, if I can uh, thank the university partners and also the Ukrainian Society for organizing this event. Uh, before I pass the floor uh, to our student, uh, Mihailo Pimkin, who is going to ask you a question, I just want to assure you that University of Birmingham is fully supporting students and staff. We have created a fund which is uh, providing students with different schemes and helping them to continue their studies. And also we are welcoming some new students who are coming to join us from September. Uh, we're equally going to host some of the academics coming from Ukraine and that will happen in September. And I will stop here because you want to hear from our students and I'm going to invite Mihailo, who is going to ask the question. And thank you very much once again on behalf of the University of Birmingham. And uh, if I can also invite His Excellency to come to University of Birmingham when that is possible. Thank you very much. Hello, Mr. President, thank um, you for finding the time. You talked about considering removing all old houses or Soviet houses, uh, especially in devastated areas. It is just an idea or are there any development plans for reconstructing our country? Thank you. Mr. President, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, this is the philosophy of a big project that covers the renovation and rebuilding of our country. It covers a lot of issues, physical and non-physical. The renovation and rebuilding of the post-Soviet buildings, it's not about only a quality of life, it's not only about these destruction and the damage caused by the aerial bombardment of Russian aircraft, and you would need to rebuild that because people would need to somewhere to live. It's all about rebuilding our country. It's all about restarting Ukraine. I want the people to return to their native streets and native cities, but that would be a different Ukraine, a Ukraine that has defended its independence, its future, and I want this future to be mentally different, not in the Stalin's age buildings, but in the independent Ukrainian environment. So that's what about uh, this process, and that will be a large reconstruction, rebuilding process, a renovation of our country. Of course, I would like to say that we would be able to reconstruct all the buildings, but that would depend not only on our wishes, but 
on the financial support. But nonetheless, when we will start this large program, I believe that would be the movement that will become unstoppable until we finally rebuild everything. Again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for your insightful answer. We usually speak of the peace, humanitarian development nexus, and you've laid it out for us. May I now invite the University of Cambridge moderator, president of the Cambridge Union, and I advisedly use the word president with a small p here, Hello, uh, Mr. President, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, I'm Letty, a student of architecture and president of the Cambridge Union, where we are sat today and joined by a packed audience in your honor. The Union is the oldest debating and free speech uh, society in the world and is proud of our long and extensive tradition of hosting prominent figures from all areas of public life, including the Dalai Lama, President Ronald Reagan, Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, and without a doubt, your name, Mr. President, will be etched into our proud history. I'll pass you on now to Oksana, President of the Cambridge University Ukrainian Society, who will be asking our question. Uh, I'm Oksana Hetman. I'm a student here at Cambridge University, and um, I have a question from our Ukrainian academic community especially from people in, uh, people in international institutions. We believe that the future in, of our country is directly dependent on uh, science, research, and education. And for us here, it is essential to ensure the highest level of professionalism and academic integrity. With this in mind, we are very curious if there are any personnel changes planned in the Ministry of Education due to the recently discovered issues with academic integrity of the minister himself. Are you planning any such changes in the near future? <laughs> Mr. President, please, you have the floor again, repeatedly. Thank you for this question. You know, in addition to the leading professions that are highly in demand with the Ukraine and in the whole world, I believe that you forgot to mention another quality, which is uh, very important and it's highly in, in demand in Ukraine and in other words. And that quality is a leadership, leadership skills. And that's very important. If I uh, remember, uh, if I uh, understood correctly, the last name, your last name is Hatman. So that's, a surname of a, of a true leader and you truly understand that whenever someone is appointed to a senior position that person has to be a leader has to be focused on uh, the uh, fulfillment of the major um, goals and we've uh, started with the rebuilding of our country and of course we'll be rebuilding and resetting the education there will be a lot of demand from the state on uh, the students with the modern professions in addition to a traditional one because you clearly understand that under conditions of uh, a dangerous neighborhood the technology and the security are of an utmost importance and of course we will not tolerate any issues of corruption because this is also related to the security of our state with the correct use of funding with the correct use of the talented pool of resources we need to have businesses coming to us and not from us so of course our task is to consolidate and make our le uh, leadership stronger to consolidate every ministry and those who will be manage to stay they will stay and those who would not be modern enough those who would not be ready to develop at a pace that the state has to take, then they will be replaced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Leadership in crisis and recovery is the theme uh, of your question. I now give the floor uh, to City University of London, moderator, president of City University of London, Sir Anthony Finkelstein, who was chief of 
scientific advisor for national security to Her Majesty's government from 2015 to 2021. Thank you very much. As its president, on behalf of City University of London, our students and staff, thank you, President Zelensky, for the service you and Ukrainian people are giving for democracy and European security. I'll pass the floor to our student, Marina Pavluk. Uh, hello, my name is Marina Pavluk. I'm uh, from Rivne. Uh, I study aeronautical engineering at City University, and I have the following question for you. Uh, will there be any initiatives to attract STEM specialists from science, technology, engineering, and mathematics from abroad? If so, what steps do you see in implementing these programs, and what will be their uniqueness from existing foreign ones? Thank you. Your Excellency, please, you have the floor. Marina, thank you for the question. You know, we don't have the time. And today we are at war. And when we will be victorious, we will need to act swift. And I would like to underline, we need to have uh, energy, we need to have modern technologies. And even before the start of the war, I offered an initiative to construct a large university uh, with the support of the president. And this university would be focusing on engineering, on uh, bio, um, nanotechnologies, and modern professions, something that our country truly needs. And unfortunately, the priorities has shifted after a large scale aggression of Russia into Ukraine. Of course, now we are all fighting, but I would like to underline that these initiatives, there will be a lot of uh, them in our country, because I would like to underline, we don't have a lot of time. We need to uh, act swiftly. We need to support creative ideas, startups, a lot of many things. And our Ministry for Digital Transformation will be presenting a lot of them and uh, they will be telling on how we are developing our DIA app, what sort of services would be provided through uh, digital means. And we are in the right direction. Even now during the war, we continue to develop this. Those initiatives with results, with, with results to state support and financial support to a range of startups now, all of those initiatives will be there, and that will play a, a significant role in the development of our state. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. With your optimism of victory, uh, anchored on energy, vision, creativity, and digital transformation, I now give the floor to the University of Coventry moderator, Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Paul Noon, enterprise and innovation, quite appropriate. Hello, uh, Mr. President. It's my honor to welcome you to Coventry University. As you know, uh, this city has faced the darkest of times itself and has welcomed refugees from across the globe. And our people, our communities stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Ukraine. Uh, behind me, you will see a book that has been uh, a single edition book that has been produced by some Coventry University students who are uh, raffling this, uh, uh, this book off for charity. And currently it is uh, standing at 130,000 uh, pounds and all of that money will go to the, uh, to the Ukraine fight. Uh, I will now introduce my colleague, my student colleague, Pavel Pimkin, who will ask you uh, the question. Thank you very much, Pavel. Panie Prezydent, dobrego wieczoru. Dziękuję, że znaleźli czas dla rozmowy z nami. And now I'm switching into English. And 
Ukrainian students uh, have been very active uh, since the beginning of the war. Uh, they are joining the military forces, territorial defense, uh, volunteering uh, in different parts of Ukraine, even abroad. And I'm sure that after the end of the war, this activity only increase. So does the government plan to attract students uh, during the reconstruction period or even create accelerator programs that will create good conditions for young businessmen and startups in Ukraine? Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, you have the floor, please. Yeah. So thank you for the question. First of all, I would like to express words of gratitude for this book of uh, assistance and support. That's a true reflection of solidarity. I would like to underline my personal feelings. It's uh, not even the question about money. Uh, the question is about the support and the openness. Now, going back to your question, and there were several, in fact, questions. So let me try to answer them quickly. So speaking about the support to young specialists and startups, well, I've already started answering those questions in the beginning. So there will be a lot of programs like that and special directions where the state is ready to support. And there will be certain amount of money that we are ready to allocate in support of young specialists who are creative or enthusiastic. So that's a separate program. But there is also a big program for you to understand that there will be a large demand for different professions for the youth. And you also need to understand the scale of the program to cover the rebuilding of Ukraine. What's the essence of this program? Well, first of all, the state today, and we are offering every state uh, in the world to take patronage over city, region, or an industry. So a certain country of the world will take a patronage over certain um, regions and cities. So they will be communicating experts to experts, students to students, and we'll start rebuilding our country so that every country would be proud that they worked together with Ukrainians on building Ukraine. Now that's the bigger assets, and so far, a lot of countries are supporting my proposals, and they believe that there is a sense in doing so because Ukraine is defending the freedom, the human rights, the democracy for the whole Europe and the world. And now, in return, and I think that's very just that the whole world would be supporting and rebuilding Ukraine. So there will be a lot of work for everyone and there will be a lot of places for those who would be willing to take them. Thank you very much. Uh, again, Your Excellency, with a strong message of support, solidarity uh, in the ideals that Ukraine is fighting for on behalf of those uh, who uh, clearly are committed to liberal democracy um, as well as uh, territorial uh, integrity. May I now invite the University of Glasgow uh, moderator, Professor Peter Scabara, Ramsey Chair of Chemistry, School of Chemistry at the University. Greetings from Glasgow. It's a huge honor for me to address the President of Ukraine and also to represent the Society of Ukrainians at the University of Glasgow. Glasgow is extremely committed to give long-term support to Ukraine. We've twinned with the universities of Kyiv Mohyla Academy, Poltava State Medical University, and the Viv National Medical University as well. In October, we'll be enrolling 120 or more than 120 displaced Ukrainian students for free. We will cover their fees and we'll also cover their subsistence and accommodation as well. As a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, I highlight their efforts as well, which are substantial in raising awareness of the current crisis 
in Ukraine by interviewing and publishing the impact of the war on industrialists and chemists. And I'd also finally uh, like to add a message to the president and all Ukrainians on behalf of the local people in Scotland who have been incredibly generous in the many ways that they've supported Ukrainians. Від усіх наш Шотляндії ми посилаємо нашу щиру любов і силу. Нехай наша гарна Україна, вся Україна на віки залишається вільною. I'll now pass on uh, to our student Nivyena Karlanova, who is an undergraduate student at Kyiv Mohila Academy and the University of Glasgow. Добрий день, добрий вечір, пане президенте. Дякуємо вам за ваш час і дуже пишаємося. Good evening. Thank you for your time. Yeah. And I'm moving to our question. We came up with an urgent question. So we're wondering what is the approach of the Ukrainian government concerning Ukrainian universities and students now located in the temporarily occupied areas? What will happen to the teaching staff and students as well? And how the UK academic society and all the communities can help to overcome this educational crisis? Yeah, Thank you very much for this question. I would like to thank Glasgow for receiving our students, first of all. And thank you, Ukrainian students, uh, for uh, the demonstration of a good educational level of uh, knowledge. Uh, and uh, um, you are representing our state. You are our ambassadors, ambassadors of our academy here and uh, now speaking of uh, the tragedy it's a real tragedy i would like to use this uh, specific notion uh, this is uh, we have uh, 12 million idps uh, 5.5 million people left ukraine and the rest of them left their homes uh, and not just homes they abandoned uh, Lots of things. This is a global thing. All your life, your schooling, uh, your university, um, everything is uh, either damaged or captured by the enemy. And we are proposing different uh, techniques. Uh, some universities were moved, uh, they relocated. Some of them united with the existing universities in. Uh, the territories which are not occupied or for example Kherson University moved uh, the, um, those people who could do that could afford that because the Russian troops wouldn't let anyone leave um, they uh, put different impediments in their ways but uh, uh, all the faculty sometimes would uh, leave and we can do for students what Glasgow is doing for you uh, this is a uh, free uh, tuition uh, for all the students. Uh, it's free of charge and no limits in terms of um, um, accepting everyone. Ex the Ministry of Education will accept everyone who wants to learn without any special conditions and or any tests or examination for that matter. If you are a young adult, uh, and you are young adults uh, and you come uh, to uh, the territory which is not under occupation you have many problems uh, you have to find accommodation you have to find some income so uh, we are looking for temporary accommodation for some uh, subsistence uh, uh, support uh, mm, uh, for um, and the educational opportunities for those uh, people and we developed the online programs for the people who could not uh, leave or cannot leave uh, the occupied territories at this point we have great challenges there i'll be frank with you because the russian occupying force the uh, invaders they uh, cut off the internet uh, 
TV, uh, the banking system in the occupied territory so that uh, people are um, living in uh, the occupation and information vacuum. But I, um, um, I would like to tell you um, um, the most important thing is uh, uh, that what we want to do for our students and our schoolers uh, um, uh, um, this autumn in uh, many territories currently occupied, we would like to restore our governance uh, and uh, uh, we um, want uh, the children uh, go to school and uh, the students go to the universities under different governmental control. And this is a great task for us, uh, task number one, or mission number one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, for your message of renaissance. I now turn to the University of Manchester, uh, moderator, Dr. Anna Glu, a mobilized project postdoc, PhD student, and a Ukrainian University of Manchester alumni. You have the floor to take the question, to, to give your question, please. Good, good evening, Mr. President. Thank you very much for having us, uh, for meeting with us. Um, the city of Manchester has a very strong and active Ukrainian society, which has a very long history. And the University of Manchester conducts important research, including on topics concerning Ukraine. And um, today I want to thank the Ukrainian Student Society for gathering us all together in this room in fact, the demand was so high that we had to fill in two rooms uh, just to meet with you. And uh, I will uh, pass the microphone to one of the members of the Ukrainian uh, Student Society who will ask our question. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to discuss some uh, different topics here. And uh, we are very grateful to all the people who contributed to an organization of this meeting. And now I'll switch to English. We want to also say hello to our second room. Hello, guys, and thank you for coming. And now I'm uh, coming to our first question. Um, have any decisions been already made so far? What will be prioritized during the reconstruction of, of Ukraine? Thank you. Your Excellency, please. Thank you, thank you very question. much for the question. First of all, well, first of all, we have to restore our territorial integrity. Let me be open there because we want to rebuild our country and um, not on some parts of our territory, but uh, all the territory that belongs to us. Secondly, we have to help uh, to uh, rebuild all the infrastructure. First of all, uh, the uh, residential housing, there will be lots of architectural designs uh, and will provide houses for common people. And uh, now um, already deoccupying our territories step by step, we uh, start rebuilding the educational institutions so that uh, on the 1st of September, people can go back to school back to school, back to kindergarten, or school or university for the students. So um, the second thing is education, education institutions. And the third, um, um, objective is infrastructure. Without it, so we cannot uh, leave. This is roads, this is critical infrastructure, bridges, uh, and uh, the uh, crossings, uh, the tunnels, uh, and uh, the rivers. Uh, this is a strategic decision that will be also implemented because we have such a neighbor, we can finish this war today and tomorrow they can try to do something evil against our state again. This is important. And then technologies, like I mentioned earlier, we are making a safe, a secure state. The streets uh, should be secure, should be safe uh, with uh, gas supplies, uh, heating, lighting uh, in the streets, along the roads, uh, on the borders of our state. Uh, this is not just about architecture, 
this is also about technology, science, uh, high tech, and uh, we'll have uh, lots of such processes unfolding. I cannot say what will come first. Let me just repeat that we uh, have um, uh, little time, so we'll do things in parallel. We'll have to. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your illustrative answer. I now give the floor to the University of Oxford. Moderator, Professor Lionel uh, Tar Tarasenko, President of Rubin College, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Lead and Organizer of the Oxford University Graduate Scholarship Scheme for Ukraine Refugees. Please address your question, moderator. We are here in Oxford in the debating chamber of the Oxford Union. Boris Johnson, our prime minister, was president of the Oxford Union when he was a student in Oxford in the 1980s. I'm a British citizen, but my grandfather was born in Kharkiv and lived in Poltava. I'm professor of electrical engineering and also pro vice chancellor of the university. This is to tell you that we have had students from Ukraine, both undergraduates and postgraduates in Oxford since the early 2000s. But this year, we have set up a special scholarship scheme for refugees from Ukraine for a one-year master's course in the university starting in September. These masters are fully funded by the university and cover every subject available in Oxford. For example, MBA, advanced computer science, energy systems, diplomatic studies, genomic medicine, and many other subjects. 20 Ukrainian graduate scholars will each live in one of Oxford's historical colleges, and they will have free meals as well as a stipend, so they have no financial worries during their course in Oxford. We are deliberately offering one-year master's courses because we hope that these scholars, after completing their course, will go back to Ukraine and help in the reconstruction of your country. I would now like to welcome uh, the president of the Oxford University Ukrainian Society, Ruslan Pavlishin, to ask you a question. Good evening. I would like to ask you a question from our society. Yesterday, two British citizens have been sentenced to death in a show trial in the occupied Donbass territories. As a flagrant breach of international law, it is a direct provocation to the United Kingdom. Consequently, do you expect the United Kingdom to become more involved in the war? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Your Excellency, uh, please take the floor. Um, this should be quiet. Uh... Uh, what is happening, uh, basically, with the international law of, of yes, violation of any uh, national law and international law on the part of the Russian Federation. This is a great uh, tragedy in its own right. And uh, the two British citizens thus uh, uh, persecuted. This is a tragic uh, habit for those people, with those people. They do everything in that way. And we cannot have uh, any kind of excuses uh, uh, for such uh, steps and for such actions. But let me tell you this. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, after that, uh, um, I cannot say whether um, uh, the UK should uh, be strongly, more strongly involved. Um, I think uh, the answer is in the negative. I think uh, uh, Boris Johnson, as one of your alumni, um, 
was uh, one of the first friends to come to our rescue in this war. Uh, this is the case when we can say that Europe and all the world and uh, the skeptical countries uh, and uh, the pacifist country, well, relatively, as far as the Russian Federation is concerned, looking for some kind of um, some kind of or uh, a compromise uh, uh, to uh, preserve the business relations as much as possible for uh, those countries. Uh, this is a great signal. This is a very dangerous uh, signal for any uh, anyone. This is not just. Uh, uh, about uh, your citizens. Uh, it is uh, uh, their degrading uh, treatment for humans uh, of uh, any origin. And after such cases, the EU countries should uh, at last unite and uh, um, uh, decisively condemn uh, in actions, not in words, such uh, uh, de developments in the occupied territories. Thank you very much uh, for your answer, Mr. President. True to the word that arbitrary killing constitutes inhuman and degrading treatment. Um, and also in the circumstances is clearly uh, a violation of international human rights and international uh, humanitarian law. I now have the pleasure to give uh, the floor to University College London moderator, um, the president of University College London and provost, Dr. Michael Spence, please. Mr. President, like free people everywhere, we at the University College of London stand appalled by the suffering of your people, but in awe of their resilience, of their courage, and their love of freedom. And like universities across this country, we've been pleased to be able to offer support to our Ukrainian students and also to establish a half a million pound fund for the support of Ukrainian academics in refuge. But we've never been more proud of the fact that we teach Ukrainian language and culture and history so that those rich stories to which you alluded at the beginning of your remarks can be better understood. And it's my privilege to hand over to the president of our Ukrainian society, Anton Korchigin. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Доброго вечора, пане президент. Хоч ми зараз в Англії, але ми теж з України, всім серцем і думками. I will now switch to English. Uh, our question was relevant before the 24th of February. It was relevant before 2014, yet with the beginning of the full scale, it became even more relevant. Many young Ukrainians are currently studying or working abroad, receiving high academic qualifications and experience. And exactly this generation of Ukrainians should and wants to move their country forward. It worries about the future of their homeland and wants to contribute to the rebuilding and development of a new Ukraine. In addressing those young Ukrainians who are currently abroad, what main message would you like to convey to them? And what are your personal plans and programs in motivating them to come back home to vote avoid brain drain. That's a, that's a great question and a difficult one to answer. Indeed, so first of all, I'd like to uh, express words of gratitude to uh, Dr. Mike Spence for the support that he mentioned. And I can see that, I can feel this support and I deeply trust the, those people who support your language, your culture in the other countries by understanding that the more the person knows, then the, the more profound this person is. So we are grateful for this academic form that you've established. Thank you and thank your team. Now, going back to this question, as I've said, that's a difficult one. 
and uh, we could have a long debate over that topic, what needs to be done, what shouldn't be done, what was right, what was wrong. We could uh, say that all those 30 years, the politicians and the government were not thinking about the people and those so the people left. So we can talk on and on about this and to spare the time. But I will try to answer briefly your question. There's a lot of painful aspects in our history and because of which we've lost the most pressures we have, the smart people the brains, so to say. Now it's the moment of truth. Now it's the war in our country. And we're, when we will be victorious, we will build a new country. And uh, you have to understand our traditions, our rich history. I think you're something like 20 year old, maybe 19 years old. You're a young person, you're a student. I can't build a comfortable state for you without you. I can build a state for all of us, for our generation and for elderly people. We can try many things. We can build a modern Ukraine, but building a future without a young generation is something that is impossible to make. We can be having freedom and liberal approaches, but we have our own approach to thinking we can look based on our experience, but looking into the future as transparently as you, it's something that we can't do. Every generation is much better than the previous one. Every generation is more, more modern than the previous one. So I cannot offer you something, but I can help you to implement your dreams, to have them come to reality, to have your vision for the future come to action. That's what I can do. Well, Mr. President, you started off by saying it's a difficult issue, but I think you gave uh, a star quality answer. Um, we now uh, give the opportunity to Channel 4, um, a TV uh, coverage uh, that is based here in the UK. They are on Zoom uh, following this particular event, and they too would like to put a question to His Excellency. Channel 4, please. Yes, hello, my name is Matt Fry from Channel 4 News. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, President Zelensky. I spent quite a lot of time this year and indeed before the war in Ukraine as a journalist. And I, like many people, have been deeply impressed by the resilience of the Ukrainian people under these horrific circumstances. But I wonder, you yourself in recent days have been saying that you're losing about 100 men each day in the fighting in the Eastern Donbass region. At what stage do the circumstances compel you, Mr. President, to try and settle for some kind of peace, if that's the right word, with the Russians, to give up on some of that territory that you're trying to regain or hold at the moment? And a follow-up, if I may, in the last few months, we've seen uh, Finland and Sweden apply for NATO membership and be fast-tracked to that membership. This is something that has only come about because of the war in Ukraine, and it is something that has eluded you so far. I wonder how you feel about that. Thank you for the question. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very happy for the Finland and Sweden. I believe that's uh, a very wise choice. Although, unfortunately, that choice was made because of the war has started in Ukraine. But I believe that this aggression has resulted in those countries taking their decisions. It was the decisions taken by the leaders and their society. They've decided to have 
um, this approach and it will help them to defend their people in case of Russian aggression or in case of any other's aggression uh, by uh, the entity who's disregarding the rights and international norms. So that's a large victory already that their society has accepted that uh, decision because a large percentage of, of people who support uh, NATO uh, has increased. Now, speaking about Ukraine, well, Ukraine wanted to have that before the aggression. Ukraine wanted to have that even before the war started in 2014. And we've publicly announced about this. Now, speaking about my feelings, I can give you only one answer. Feeling for some um, stabs for or misstabs. That's the feelings that uh, should be demonstrated by those who missed the, with those steps. It's about the right decisions of um, different institutions that have to be made, and uh, that would be able to save a lot of lives. And already we had two stages of the bloody history of our country. I believe uh, if Ukraine would join NATO, there would be a fight for the independence of Ukraine, but there would be not so many losses. There could be maybe a small military conflict or provocations on the part of Russia, but I truly believe that we would be able to save a lot of lives. So it makes me sort of frustrated or angry, but that's their emotions. And I wouldn't call them a positive emotions because Ukraine wanted to, to have uh, uh, its uh, NATO future, but it wasn't given that. Still, NATO member nations are providing with support and assistance to Ukraine, and I'm not going to go into details on that. Everyone heard about this. Now, speaking about the first part of your question, throughout my presidentship, I clearly understand and I understood that every war has to finish at the table of negotiations. And I, cannot, and I understand that diplomacy can save lives. I understand this. But unfortunately, the president of Russian Federation doesn't understand this. And that's it. I mean, you need both parties uh, willing to stop the war between their countries. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And look at the rhetorics uh, that you've used. I'm not sure if that's the interpretation, but the uh, interpretation sounded like what do uh, what are you ready to concede um, or to give up? I, I'd like to say that uh, well, there is this independence of our country, and there is ne not anything that we can concede. Thank you. It's self-evident that your principled stand, Mr. President, uh, has earned um, the appreciation and admiration and support of many. We do know that there are many demands on your time, but at the same time, the intellectual depth uh, that has underlined this dialogue and exchange has inevitably led to further interest. Um, and I would uh, perhaps beg your indulgence if you have uh, some 20, 30 minutes to spare uh, for a further round of questions. And I'm so sorry, I, I, I don't have enough, enough time. I'm sorry, you I'm so see... sorry, I don't have enough time. 
I, uh, I've turned into English because uh, now I don't have the time even to spare that for the interpretation. So. Down here. Okay. It was not very bad English. That's it. I don't know. Do you hear now? You don't hear. You hear now or not? So you see this cyber attack of Russia. You don't hear me. Yeah, it, it. Okay. I'm sorry. I I said that at least at, at the end of one, one meeting, I I, I I decided to speak a little bit a little bit English to show you that in Ukraine we know we know English yes not so good as you know but 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 you and you, and you see so and you can't hear me so I I think that that your administration decided that my English is not so good to to be sure for, for, for you but next time next time my level will be higher thank you thank you very much thank you so much Thank you so much. All the best. <laughs>